All right, y'all. So in this lab, we're going to build a catapult. Everyone say catapult. 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 A catapult. A catapult is an energy converter. What is a cat catapult? An energy converter. Energy is the ability to do work. That definition was in our last, um, our last lab, and I didn't require it in the introduction, so I'm going to require it in this one. So I'm just going to say here, yeah, I'm going to say catapult right here, and then I'm going to call it an energy converter. Oh, let me get bigger. All right, I'm going to say it's an energy converter. Is converter spelled with two E's or is it convertor? Okay. All right, a catapult is an energy converter. My first physics class, the way I didn't get in trouble for having that war with slingshots that I had my students build and uh, hiding behind the uh, principal's car during the war when we were hitting it with beans and stuff, which we were shooting, is, is my students uh, memorized the chant. These are not slingshots, they're energy converters. And then the next thing they said is they convert elastic potential energy into kinetic energy. So these convert. We're making catapults. It's sort of like a slingshot. Uh, huh, we should still have a war, yeah. Convert, these convert elastic potential energy. Into kinetic energy. And energy is the ability to do work. Of course, work is also uh, something that has a very specific and explicit definition in physics that is not the same as its definition in other places. But we'll, we'll skip that. OK. Catapult is an energy converter that converts elastic potential energy into kinetic energy. So essentially, uh, you got some kind of a base for your catapult. All right. You've got some kind of a, a throwing arm. Uh, you're going to have some kind of cup here. And you're also going to have probably, it actually depends on how you design this thing. Um, you're going to have some kind of framework here. Uh, what did I call it? I didn't call it anything. And you're going to have an elastic band right here that stretches as you pull the throwing arm back. Now, there's different ways you can design this thing. But regardless of how you design it, right, a catapult has some kind of elastic band. It's going to have some kind of a base. It's going to have a throwing arm. In your throwing arm is where you're going to place your projectile, which will probably be a marble.
So we've got this drawn out, right? Let's draw uh, the forces on the throwing arm. at pullback. So if I hold this thing and pull it down, um, what's going to be exerting, exerting a downward force on the throwing arm? If I use my hand. Uh, it's sort of like a kind of normal force. We're not going to get that complicated, though. My, so the for, my hand, right, is going to be one of the forces. Sorry, <laughs> I just made it like, sound like it was all complicated. All right, so first thing you've got here is you've got the force of your hand. And I don't know what your, you know, drawing skill level is. I'm gonna do a little cartoon hand. It's not gonna be awesome. Yeah, we can just go F hand. The force of the hand is going to pull down. The thumb's weird. Oh, well, whatever. I said I wasn't going to make it good. So what else is pulling down on the throwing arm? Nice, force of gravity. Yeah, you got your FG. FG is always here. Our friend, the force of gravity. What, what is pulling in the other direction? No. The band, yeah, the elastic band. So you have the force of the elastic band. So let's go force elastic, okay? So the force of that elastic band is gonna determine really the velocity at which the throwing arm travels uh, when you release it. Get it, let's get it shape shape. All right. So now, what do you do next? You pull this thing that you pull this thing back. Then what do you do? Yeah, I don't it. Well, you release it, right? So here's the thing that you need to know: elastic potential energy. Uh, the amount of force determined by an elastic band. Okay the force that an elastic band puts on an object, the force an elastic band puts on an object puts on an object depends on The distance it is stretched from relaxed. And the properties of the band.
It depends on the distance it is stretched from relaxed. So the same band is putting more force on my two hands if I hold it here than it is if I hold it here than it is if I hold it here. And then if I'm not stretching at all, it's not putting any force on my hands, okay? So what we're talking about here is a force that is changing as the band goes from stretched to not stretched, okay? Ooh. Is it alive? Wow. Solid. Is that yours? Ooh. Wait, I didn't hear that. Is it is it okay or not? Okay. Oh, brilliant. Not a problem. Concrete floor doesn't care. Okay. The force an elastic band puts on an object depends on the distance it is stretched from relaxed and the properties of the band. Okay. So let's do forces after release. All right. Once you let go of this thing, it's going to start moving upwards. You can't see. So there's your base. All right. Now we see you've got the force of your elastic band. You've got F elastic. Which is getting smaller and smaller as the throwing arm gets closer to not stretching the band. And then what's the other force that's always acting on things? Gravity. It's my elastic band. Force of gravity. Uh, which way is the arm accelerating in? If the catapult's functioning properly. Yeah. That way. Um, and so the velocity is also in this direction. Now, there's something very important uh, to constructing a catapult that you don't really think about till you start building one of these things. There has to be something that stops your throwing arm because the purpose of the catapult is to transfer the velocity of the throwing arm into the object the cup contains. So that when the throwing arm stops, the object becomes what is called a projectile. Okay. Purpose of a catapult is to destroy things that are behind something you can't see over. In order to do that, you need a projectile that has substantial velocity. Okay. So you have to have something that stops the throwing arm but doesn't stop the projectile, all right? So we're gonna talk here about where, where the energy is converted. All right, so next step. Your catapult arm has got to stop The elastic band is no longer stretched. And there has to be nothing stopping the marble. Make sort of a droopy band here. All right. So now, um, 
What's the what direction is the force on the throwing arm? It's like that. Yeah, this has to be the force of whatever we want to call this, the stand. Ah. Yeah, let's call this a stand, this thing. All right. Now, if there's nothing here, right, then the acceleration in this direction, the acceleration of the throwing arm We also still have gravity, right? So now the acceleration of arm is in this direction and its velocity becomes zero when it hits that stand, whatever it is you have that obstructs it. Now, interestingly, you can use like the mater property material, the materials property to do that. You can have like a, people have used it to where they use the elasticity of the actual wood that they use to construct to fling the thing. And then at a certain point, the wood won't bend any further in that direction. And that can fling something as well. Um, I prefer to build a structure that stops the throwing arm uh, as part of my design. Um, and I also prefer, for reasons that'll become clear in a second, to stop it before it's completely vertical. If you stop the throwing arm when it's completely vertical, as we'll look at in a second, your, your trajectory ends up going like this, and down. So it can't actually go over something. 45 degree angle is optimum for velocity and distance. Yeah, that's the best angle to stop it at. Um, okay. So as soon as this happens, so this is, this is the forces on the throwing arm. At impact with the stand. Okay. And this is the moment the throwing arm converts its energy to the marble. The throwing arm its kinetic energy Shoot, I want to write it to where I can take a photograph because we have lines in it. Transfers. It's kinetic energy is a better word. Kinetic energy to the marble. All right, and now we can look at the forces on the marble as a projectile. Forces on the marble as a projectile. So once this happens, the marble becomes a projectile. The definition of a projectile is any object in free fall with some amount of velocity that is not vertical, uh, which, which we have the definition in here. So the force of gravity is pulling down on your marble. It is not a projectile. It's an object in free fall. But if I throw something off a building like this, slightly that way, it's a projectile. It has to have some non-vertical velocity. Uh, 
during the period of time when gravity is the only thing acting on it to be a projectile. So forces on the marble is a projectile, just the force of gravity, okay? Now, the reason why you want your launch angle not to be completely vertical is because if its velocity is this way and it's only got a force of gravity pulling down, can it make it over anything? It can't, right? It's, it's the same as firing like a pistol or an arrow. Okay, it's just gonna go straight and get lower and lower as it travels, okay? The purpose of a catapult is to launch something in an arc. So you're gonna want, so you desire, your desired velocity is gonna be like that when that throwing arm stops at an angle, an upwards angle. What direction will the projectile's acceleration always be in? It's acceleration while it's traveling. What's the, only, what's the only force acting on a projectile? So what's the direction of acceleration? Down. The acceleration of a projectile is always straight down. It doesn't really, unless it's going at tremendously high velocity, it doesn't even really have air resistance. Remember, air resistance gets stronger as velocity increases. So obviously, air resistance affects something like a bullet, which is going very, very fast. Okay. Um, but our marbles are not going to be going that fast. So what this means is air resistance uh, has a very tiny, the force of air resistance is going to be like, a teeny tiny effect on our projectile. They will be going pretty fast. There will be some small amounts of effect, okay? Right, and so we'll have a teeny tiny acceleration. I'm gonna make gravity acceleration bigger. We might have some teeny tiny acceleration in this direction, okay? But to note, the projectile, once it's been released by whatever hurls it, does not speed up in the horizontal direction. It's not how it works. Right? An object in motion will stay in motion. An object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The unbalanced force is gravity. So it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to come down after it's been launched. So this would be your desired initial velocity, I would say, initial. Okay. That's important to say because no matter how you, um, how you fire a projectile, it's always gonna accelerate in the downwards direction. So if you have an initial velocity like that, then this is what its motion is gonna look like over time. So this is a hypothetical path of projectile right here. All right, let's see. I'm going, to I'm going to take a step back so people can see everything that we've drawn here. Hopefully. Uh, and make sure that you've got all the diagrams necessary to begin your uh, path of projectile. Sorry literally the thing I just wrote, which is probably the most important thing for us to be able to see. Yeah, yeah, take pictures of your diagrams as soon as they're done. Try and find a decent spot for light to try not to sh get in shadows in your way and stuff. I'm gonna do the same thing. Take a picture, this is way better than the diagram I did last year. Pardon? Up to you. I'm, I might try and get them all in one. Yeah, myself. Um, since I almost didn't go outside the lines except for my stupid hands that I drew. Huh, that's not casting a shadow, that's good.
Um, so does anyone have any questions about sort of the general idea? All right. So the purpose of this lab is to explain and use the concepts of potential energy, kinetic energy, force, and acceleration to construct a catapult and launch a projectile. So right there, underline all these words. You have to define all these words for sure. In addition, you'll use the introduction of this lab report to demonstrate a fundamental understanding of all the physics we have studied this year. Okay, you will design and construct a catapult that is as precise, that's important, as possible. Does anyone remember what precision means? Nope, they, they, the two things mean two different things. Sort of. As repeatable, so for a, for a, for a, not, not to call a catapult a weapon, but for a weapon, what it means is, is your shots land close together. Okay, so precision is, precision is how close a series of measurements or shots in this case are to each other. shots are to each other, okay? So that's what you're trying to do. So no matter what else, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Yes, okay. Uh, can you make sure you drop the block in the door so you can come back in easily? So no matter what else you choose to do with this catapult, you wanna try, when you, when you improve it, that'll be the second part of the lab, you want to improve the precision at least. Okay, so you will build a functional catapult that can fire a small projectile in an arc over an obstruction to hit a target beyond the obstruction. Hypothesis, your first hypothesis will state the level of precision you predict to achieve with your first catapult, okay? So to do this, you'll state the size of the target you predict all of your shots to fall into. Example, I hypothesize my first catapult will be precise within a 30 centimeter radius target. Your groupings. How close together can you get your groupings? Now, I want to talk about this for a second. So my catapult kind of fires off to a specific angle side every time. So all I did was I spent some time lining up where I wanted my target to be, and then I chose that to make my, you know, my goal target. I literally marked it out with tape and measured a specific shape. And then I measured, yes, it went in that spot or no, it did not for 10 shots. Or I think I might've even done 30. I can't remember. Um, okay. Your second hypothesis will be written after building your first functional catapult. We've done this before. Okay. It should predict how a design change that has to be specific to your initial catapult will improve its precision. Okay, so specifically, and we just define that. Right, so you'll say, I'll change X, Y, or Z. And it should be based on observations of how this thing functions or works, obviously. All right, you'll have to add details. The second hypothesis about what you will improve that's specific, as I said, how your improvements will make it better. So this is some kind of reason it can, it should be related to physics and observations of the first catapult. Okay, and then also how you will measure your improvement. So both of your hypotheses, so both hypotheses need to define how precision is measured. And I wouldn't change it between trials actually is measured, right? Because if you change more than one thing, you no longer know if you're testing 
uh, whether or not your catapult's improved its precision. All right, these are two new definitions. One is elastic potential energy, obviously needs to be in your introduction, and the other one is projectile. So the elastic potential energy is the energy given to an object because of the distance an elastic band is stretched away from its unstretched position. It depends on that distance and the properties of the band. A projectile is when an object has velocity in a horizontal direction as it enters free fall, it is called a projectile. The projectile is an object that has an initial velocity in any direction other than up or down and has no forces acting upon it other than the force of gravity. So as soon as you release something from something that fires it, it becomes a projectile. So at the outset of this lab, we'll draw some free body diagrams. We did that and discuss the basic principles of the catapult. We did that. You'll then write an introduction that fulfills the final exam requirements of this class. After this, you'll research catapults and come to class prepared with diagrams and drawings so that you can start constructing your rubber band propelled catapult. So next class, I'm literally going to have everyone writing the introduction and, and hopefully get close to finishing it. Um, and then you're going to look online after you do that for like different catapults you figure you could construct with popsicle sticks, uh, binder clips, and rubber bands. Uh, and they, these are the catapults that fire a marble. Okay, so now here's the thing that's weird. Since this is our final lab, okay, uh, your introduction not only has free body diagram of your catapult, it must explain how the catapult converts elastic potential energy to kinetic energy. Shoot, I put all that in the diagram. Oh, well, whatever. We've accomplished it. That's fine. Um, it also must define your shot as a projectile and explain how the projectile acts once it's released. You haven't done that yet. That'd be defining projectile would do this. You're going to say what forces act on a projectile during flight and define each of these forces in the terms we defined them earlier this year. You need to come up with a way to measure the catapult's average horizontal velocity. Okay, so you need to talk about in your introduction that you're also going to measure its average horizontal velocity, which is how quickly uh, it, it, it's displaced from where each shot starts to where each shot ends. Now, what's difficult about that is each, each projectile shot's gonna travel a different distance and it's a little tricky to measure. I actually, I actually did these in my front yard. Firing these on the field would be a good thing because what's beautiful about grass is, is when the marble drops in it, it tends not to bounce or anything. It's really nice. It just like, bloop, stays right there. Wait, so what is the force? What is the average horizontal direction? Uh, it's, it's, it's velocity just in the horizontal direction from, from the cup to wherever it lands horizontally. Um, though your hypothesis might concern one of the other physical elements listed for a catapult below, you still need to give a general definition for force as well as define each of the specific forces acting upon your projectile at different moments in its journey. For full credit, each definition needs to be within the introduction paragraphs, relate to the element of your catapult that involve them. Again, you're just nesting definitions. That's all that means. All right. So here's all the things we're asking you to measure. Uh, we want you to measure the height of the projectile for one shot per trial set. We don't care about you do it, trying to do that every time. It's difficult to do. We want you to have some estimate of how, how high does it arc, right? Because again, if it's actually a catapult you're designing, that's actually important. Um, so here's a bunch of suggestions about things that you can change that might improve performance, given you know, years of making these things with students. Um, a lot of these things uh, are ways that you could improve precision but you can propose any change you want. Some students build an entirely new catapult. Other students just fix one thing. I personally am in the fix one thing camp because I'm kind of lazy when it comes to doing extra things. Uh, whereas I feel like I'm not, you know, by definition lazy, I just like want to work smart, not hard, right? If possible. However, if your first catapult's trash, <laughs> Um, because you're trying to work smart, not hard, you might just have to rebuild a new one. But we have time for that, okay? Um, 
Okay, so again, methods, you need photos, obviously. There's a bunch of different methods here, if you think about it. You, you have construction methods for two catapults, you have data collection methods, right? Um, uh, again, uh, it talks about trying to find a way to obtain data that's precise, okay? And I gave you some suggestions like using turf or grass to like as a landing zone, something that it kind of stays in. Um, although people have used buckets before too, which can be really successful because it's like it's it's like in the bucket or it isn't. It's kind of a nice way to measure me measure precision or big boxes work, and we often have a lot of boxes here in class. Um, okay, so you have to work on this by yourself without peers. Blah blah blah. I'll send the email out uh, to everybody and families that I send about new units, um, and then this one will talk about that. Um, Boom. So you get two grades. You get a grade on your experimental. And by the way, this has always been true. Uh, people's experimental grades are good ways to track your progress about whether or not you're where I think you ought to be. I'm usually about two weeks behind our work on those so that like if you're only if you're more than two weeks behind, does this get problematic in, your, in the grade book? Um, but then interestingly, uh, if you achieve the things in the end, these grades change. They're, they're, they're plastic. So you turn on, uh, except for this can't be late. It's the last lap. Cool. Uh, and then finally, the rubric, obviously this introduction with all those definitions is worth twice as much as normal. Obviously the methods is worth twice as much as normal because you're writing two methods for two catapults. Obviously the data is worth twice as much as normal. Actually, that's not so obvious. There's not that much data for this thing. Oh, well, this is a lot of free points here in the data section, get them. Uh, and then the conclusion, why is everything worth twice? Oh, well, who cares? I already made the rubric. It's posted. That's, that's what it is. Cool. Um, and then we should take a break and then we got to do our, uh, our thing, whatever it's called, the assembly, right? It's Wednesday. Uh, I literally always forget.